It's Wizards vs. Lesbians, a podcast for your ears. Hello, and welcome to Wizards vs. Lesbians. My name is Isaac. <laughs> I'm Alexis. And today we are doing our best to discuss Camp Damascus by Chuck Tingle. Uh, and we've established that I'm doing the plot. So, in a small town in rural Montana, uh, there lies a church, uh, a church of the something pines, um, which is... Heavily, Kingdom of the Pine. Kingdom of the Pines, which is heavily implied to be uh, Mormon. Um, or other kinds of weird evangelical. We'll, yes. We can argue about this after the spoiler zone. Indeed. Um, and in this community, there is a 20-year-old high school senior, which is the first sign that you get that something is terribly wrong, um, <laughs> named uh, uh, Rose Darling, um, who is a great believer, um, uh, but... She is now being expected to pair up with a, you know, the local jock um, who she's been friends with since childhood. But A, she doesn't really understand this because she's autistic. And B, she doesn't really want to do this because she's gay. But she certainly doesn't know that she's gay. Um, And this town also happens to house Camp Damascus, the most successful uh, gay conversion camp um, ever. Um, 100% success rate this camp has. But why does it have that high a success rate? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Um, does that cover it? Yeah, pretty much. All right. Uh, are there lesbians in this book? Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, wizards? I mean, there's... Yeah, basically. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> and they are in conflict eventually. Oh, boy. Why should you read this book? Um, I think if you like horror movies... This is very much the experience of watching a horror movie. I think this, in fact, would work much better as a movie. Mm. That's uh, that's tepid, I would say, as a recommendation. I, I, I thought that parts of it were very compelling, um, and that it did, and that it had some interesting moments. Yeah, I was definitely a little disappointed. There are bits and pieces of it which work really well, like the uh, the sort of the dawning. Um, creepiness is very good, um, particularly yeah. near the beginning. Um, I would say that the first section of the book worked much better for me than um, the later sections. Yes. But... Um, this is the thing about horror movies, or terror movies as this book styles them, um, is that uh, generally the ones where you never see the monster are more effective. Uh, and yeah. this is not one of those. But during that period where we Or haven't... if you see the monster, you shouldn't explain the monster. Yes, this book is very, very interested in explaining everything, which is one of its uh, weak points. Um, but uh, yeah, no. It, at the beginning, there are a couple of like nice, you know, it's a it's a normal everyday town, but something's wrong. Uh, moments which are which are nice, um, and then it kind of falls apart. Uh, yeah. As to why you shouldn't read this book, um, it made me feel bad for Mormons. I still don't think it's about Mormons, but... Um... I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% sure that it's about Mormons, but we can get to that. Um, it made me feel... Well, okay, it made me feel bad for the kind of evangelical Christians who run conversion camps, um, which is an incredible achievement. Um, it's, like, weirdly... Uh, it, 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 it adds this element of supernatural horror, which actually undercuts the actual horror that it's discussing. Which is a real problem, actually. Like, this is a this is not an uncommon problem, I think, in horror movies, that the thing that the horror is a metaphor for is actually just way more horrifying straight up than its metaphorical incarnations. Yeah, it makes it easier to dismiss. Um, yeah. Also, this is an extraordinarily poorly written book. That's unfair. It's actually kind of a normally poorly written book. Like, j- both in terms of the prose quality and just in terms of A following B. Uh, I would say that um, I would call the prose quality competent, but not super exciting. Um, and that, you know, character character voice, the character voices aren't very well developed. And I think that the construction um, and organization is actually the real weak point over the prose. Yeah, no, the pro- I mean, when I say it's extraordinarily poorly written, I mean, like, um, I know the the handbook that this kind of prose comes out of, um, and it's like perfectly sufficient for some kinds of work. Um, 
for a novel, not so much. And that's also where the construction part comes in. Um, but uh, we'll get into that after the spoiler zone. Let's see here. Uh, is there anything else that we should talk about before we get into content warnings? Um, no, I don't think so. All right. Um, I guess, I guess actually, why should you watch this if you want, you know, an autistic protagonist um, who is... Better autistic protagonists are available. That's fair. But she's a, I think she's a really reasonable autistic protagonist. Well, um, I also want, kind of wanted to get, to get into that because there's, there are some things about the Chuck Tingle persona which uh, are a little bit questionable. And um, I think they dovetail with the kind of characterization of autism that this book gives us. Okay. Um, but that having been said, uh, content warnings. Um, I would say, uh, uh, obviously, body horror. It's a horror movie. Um, yeah. Bugs. Uh, bugs up inside you, finding an entrance where they can. Um, I think that this book's uh, per portrayal of drug use is actively irresponsible. <laughs> um, and that's, we can again get into that in the spoiler zone, but like, that's not how that works. And if you <laughs> do it the way that she's doing it, you're going to kind of ensure that you have a terrible time with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I let's see here. Obviously, you know, rampant homophobia, um, religious uh, extremism, conversion, um, bad pastors, bad parents. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, every everything that you can infer from the plot precy that we gave you. Mm hmm. All right, spoiler zone time. Spoiler zone time. Once upon a time there were a couple of fools who tried to make a podcast about a book by an internet famous person, but they weren't sufficiently complimentary in the spoiler zone right now. So, um, I think that the reason that uh, it's not that it's, you know, this is not one-to-one -one Mormons. Um, uh -huh. But it's not not Mormons. <laughs> um, well, so here's the thing, though. First of all, she's way more familiar with Pentecostal, like, charismatic Christianity stuff like snake handling than I would expect your average Mormon to be. She's well, she's more aware of just about anything than you would expect her to be, because one of her superpowers as an autistic protagonist is that she is aware of all facts. Yes. But no, but I mean, the thing is that she seems to be not aware of it in a, I have read about this, but in a, this is part of the culture I grew up in sort of way. Um, as somebody who is, you know obviously in no way a Christian, but did grow up in the South and thus was exposed to a lot of them. Um, I just, I mean, I, I think that this could be, I, I think this could be Mormonism, but I could just as easily port this onto all the various weird evangelical sects that, you know, run all the conversion camps. Right. So my, uh, my take on this being Mormonism, um, Number one, they have their own messiah, um, and he's a mid 19th century dude with his own sort of, you know, backstory a la Joseph Smith. Um, number two, uh, they are very, uh, um, it, it's sort of the idea that, uh, that sort of made this church famous and successful is that they, uh, is they're incredibly enthusiastic of marrying capitalism with the church and, uh, that's very much Mormonism. It's very much not snake handling Pentecostalism. I mean, it's very, but look, look, having your own, look, first of all, having your own weird charismatic pastor Messiah is something that I have totally run into in the South. And also part number three, this is Montana. And also the marriage of capitalism. Um, yes. The Montana thing is much more compelling, uh, but you know, the marriage of capitalism again, actually, not that doesn't strike me as particular like I don't know the thing about Mormonism is that it's just better organized than these guys yeah no it's it's on a much smaller scale right like it's on a much smaller scale part of what makes Mormonism like Mormonism you know this could have been minus the polygamy Mormonism like a hundred years ago when it was still sort of weird and fringy but at this point Mormonism is a global enterprise and I, I just I think that some of this is coming out of the weird, you know, the weird controlling uh, Christianity that we are most likely to see in, like, the public eye these days is Mormonism. But 
Um, the just the pastor really gave off, you know, creepy hip pastor vibes um, of the sort that you know. Of, well, what was that terrible Mars Hill? I think it was in Seattle. So I mean, we we are we are going a bunch of different places at once because this they part of the sort of the deal, and like we we sort of scrape all kinds of you know, uh, basically groups of people that online uh, queer people do not like into this pot. Right, and that is that's part of the problem. This guy has the help of Silicon Valley to create his demon machines, which is again why it's sort of read to me like Mars Hill. Do yeah. you remember Mars Hill? Of course, I remember Mars Hill. It's okay. it's one of many, <laughs> one of many, um, many, many. It, but there, there's something that has a really similar aesthetic that opened up uh, here in this town, and it's uh, it really weirds me out. <laughs> so, but so here's my um, so, but yes, it's obviously a Christian cult, um, right? But sort of this is a question that came to my mind while I was reading this. It's like, okay, so. Um, the 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 way that this book ends is um a hell is real b demons are real c this religious organization that claims to be christian and has their own like messiah and weird other things they do are actually satanic right actually okay so no no no, no. sorry I, i'm going to interrupt because this is a huge pet peeve of mine with a lot of queer media including actually this kind of bothered me a little bit about um we know the devil which i thought was a great piece of art but mm -hmm. so much of like queer anti-christian homophobia um stories especially speculative stories are you know really buy into the christian you know this like very christian worldview it's just that you know they flip who the good and bad guys are i personally do not mind this dynamic i think that gay satan is cool the ones that I'm under, the ones where Satan is still the bad guy and God is weirdly woke. And it's just a human conspiracy that has made us wrong about what God thinks. Yeah, no, and it's it's sort of, you know, if we were to say, who, how did this generation of queer kids end up so puritanical about so many different things? The, uh, the usual answer that we're given is, uh, Oh, they still have the mindset of people who grew up in evangelical Christianity, just they've changed a few of the words around. Um, and they still want somebody to go to hell, which this book gives them in like a potentially very cynical way. <laughs> um, very cynical and extremely literal way. Right, exactly. Now, the reason that I bring it up, which I'm not, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, but the reason that I bring it up vis-a-vis -vis the Mormonism angle is that uh -huh. like, um, this is something that I've heard said about Mormonism by other Christian sects. Uh, and the, and the, when you get to that sort of preponderance of like, you know, legally distinct, but similar. And then also we are, uh, going to lean into conspiracy theories involving satanic rituals and blood. Um, I begin to, I mean, a, aren't they bad enough just as they are? Do we really need to bring this into it? <laughs> and B, like, you you start, I start to think, uh, I start to think about, like, you know, the sort of calumnies that drive people further into their cults, you know? The sort of things that, the sort of lies and conspiracy theories that, you know, make, like, people who are in organizations like this more insular because of the, the horrible lies that are being spread out about them in the outside right, this world. Is why, this is why you should actually be polite to the Jehovah's Witnesses who knock on your door. Yeah, no, uh, one example. of the reasons that people are sent on mission is so that they can, you know, be confronted with rudeness and hostility and then come back. And again, that's this is something the Mormons do. Um, and the, but again, and the Jehovah's, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Witnesses. I mean... You know, yeah, it doesn't need to be the Mormons specifically. I, like the I real agree thing with that, here, but... the, the real thing here is that I think you're underestimating just how much weird fringy christianity is out there <laughs> this is true it's really the montana thing more than anything else because that's you know it's the, the montana right thing the definitely does is definitely mormon country but um but you know uh I, this is this is also set in, in montana because chuck tingle or at least the chuck tingle persona lives in montana right and at the end of the day it, it doesn't matter whether this is like a thinly veiled um you know take on a particular church 
Right. What this actually is, is dumping all of the things that queer people make fun of Christians for um, into one pot and stirring it together. Right. Exactly. And That's, you know, that when, is why you get stuff that looks very Mormon next to Pentecostal snake charming. You don't need to make things up about churches that are bad. I will hold people to the same standards, denigrating faith that I would if they were talking about my own people. The religions that you don't like are not kidnapping babies or stealing children's blood. It's the super rich who are doing that, obviously. Um... And like one of the reasons that I, uh, I I saw a post actually recently, which which I thought made a sort of a nice counterexample to this, which is like you know I hooked up with a Mormon guy when who went to B Y U you know when I was in college and he you know I gave him a blowjob and he uh, and he told his pastor about it and it ended up with him being you know held back a year because of this. Um, and you know, years later I got in touch with him and he was like that, you saved my life. That blowjob saved my life. That was like my first step out of this, you know, system. Um, and I'm like, that's sort of the way that you do it. You know, <laughs> like in terms of, <laughs> in terms of like, you know, these are very different approaches to, to, to trying to free somebody from a, from a religious cult. But, you know, I think in the end, the blowjob technique is probably more effective over the long term. I mean, I could go off. I mean, I could go off on a whole tangent about de-radicalization and how no matter how abhorrent the views of people, we actually do have to at, at least attempt to, you know, reach out in a kind and friendly manner if we ever want to give, you know, if we ever want to, there to be a de-radicalized path out. Um, yeah, and but, it's just a matter of whether we want there to be a de-radicalized path out or not. Which, um, obviously, we do, but anyway. Yeah, no, because the alternative is, um, it involves camps. Anyway. Um, uh, you're right. So anyway, um, so this has been a long digression over the Christianity in the book, which is one of the many things in the book. Um, but is not actually the only thing going on. <laughs> this is true. Segway to saying nice things. So I will say, one thing I thought that this book did well was that initially you go in thinking that the, you know, part, the, the dread that's hanging over at least the beginning is how is she going to end up at Camp Damascus and that the rest of the book will be about getting out. Um, yes. Yes. And so the sort of growing realization that, no, actually she had, she was already there, um, that, you know, I, I enjoyed that. I did too, but it also sort of dovetails with a, uh, a another thing about this book that I uh, think is very zeitgeisty and also kind of a drag, which is that nothing really bad happens to the... Right, no, and part of the thing that really undermines this is that, you know, Part of what makes horror work is that you genuinely don't, you know, enough horror movies and books end badly for the protagonist that you genuinely don't know whether or not, uh, you know, how it's going to end. And so, and I never, I was never tempted. I, I will, I'm one of those people who will happily flip to the end and read the last couple chapters of a book to decide whether or not it's, I'm willing to read the rest. And I was never tempted because it was obvious that nothing really bad was ever going to happen to our protagonist, especially once it became clear that she was never going to Camp Damascus because, you know, she'd already been. Yes, um, I agree. I agree entirely. And the problem is that she never gets really gets back any memories of anything really bad happening. No. Like it is, you know, the fact that they implanted, you know, demonic fly larva inside her and erased all of her memories um, is very creepy, but she never actually remembers any of those parts. She remembers just enough to solve the puzzle, but never enough to, like, give any sense of this camp being actually horrifying. Yeah, and, like, so the worst thing that happens to her is that she she barfs up some flies, which is unpleasant, but not apparently very painful, and her finger gets broken once. Um, she gets in a car accident, but, like, nothing, no attention is spent on, like, that being traumatic or painful at all, which is weird. She gets like, she gets like burned over half her body, but she's pretty much fine after that. Um, and also uh, her, her crush um, gets her neck broken. Doesn't suffer. Um, very right, quick no, death. Yeah. Her crush, get, her crush gets her neck broken, like 
At a party. Immediately after, you know, demonstrating that she is, in fact, the straight girl crush. Right. <laughs> and then is immediately killed. And it's just, yes. Well, okay, so one of the things this book does really poorly is that there's this initial creepy section. Um, and then as soon as she figures, as soon as she starts to figure out what's going on, everything that happened in the, like, all of the emotional stakes of the first few chapters just vanish. Like, her straight best friend who has a thing for her and who her parents are desperately trying to set her up with to make her straight, you know, she turns him down and he is upset, but he doesn't even take it out on her. Um, no, he just because vanishes he's still, like, from the story. Right, like he goes, he punches his car and then he drives away and he vanishes from the story, this being like her best friend since childhood. She never, yes. it never even occurs to her to wonder, was he in on it? Yeah. Um, and again, like you said, you know, she has a crush on a girl. As soon as it is established that the girl is straight, um, she gets her neck broken by a demon, by, you know, the demon that is haunting our protagonist. And there's no even, there's no grief over it. There's no, <laughs> there's no quest sense of culpability. Yeah, it's, uh, it, well, she doesn't really have an interior life beyond stimming and remembering facts is kind of part of the problem there. Yeah, there's no real, there's no real sense. The break with her parents is it doesn't feel like a real break. Like breaking with a parent is, you know, even if in the moment it feels like, yep, this is definitely what I'm doing, and it mostly just comes as a relief. Like there's still an emotional impact. It's not, it's not, it's rare that it's a perfectly clean break. Well, no, no, no. The book, the book says, like she says. Oh, I'm experiencing this royal of emotions, like, because, you know, this is my home and like, I hate to, you know, and I love my father uh, and my mom and, and I hate to do this, you know, and, and losing them is like this incredibly traumatic and awful thing and I'm grieving. And then that paragraph is done and we move on. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> that's know? the thing is that nothing ever, n nothing ever has an, like, nothing ever lingers. Nothing ever lasts. And that makes it hard to, to like believe in the horror of Camp Damascus because, if you know, if it can be thrown off so easily, then it is, as you say, way less horrifying than the actual conversion camps that exist in this actual country. Yes, exactly, and it's like, you know, and that also sort of comes about with the ending, which is like, okay, so we've killed a. A bunch of people in the most horrific way possible they're going to hell to be tortured forever and we've burned down this thing done right and you know a lot of the book has been talking about well you know this is part of this 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 is the entire reason this town exists the entire economy of this town is based around this you know most of the people in this town are, are, are members of the church or at least are you know strong christian believers um you know what do you think is going to happen <laughs> right like uh and it's it's really it's it it's it does not really take thought number two after thought number one. However, it is always very careful to address the kind of talking points that you might expect to come up on Tumblr. Um, so every any time you come to a thought like that, the book says, "Well, I thought about this, but we're still going to do it this way," um, <laughs> in, including uh, at the part of the book where it should have ended, which is when she gets out and you know have killed both her demons. She um, she literally says, "Well, this should probably be the happy ending, but we're going back in anyway." <laughs> it's like there's a degree of self awareness about how this is not, you know, well structured. It feels like this the author got crit and then was like, "Well, I'm going to address this criticism and then continue doing this the way that I want to do it." Yeah, and I mean, it, like, so the, when the demons first appear, it's you know, there is something a little bit creepy and mostly hilarious. Right? They're wearing name tags. Like, that's funny, but also creepy. Um, and, like, there's a bunch of good places there that you could go with that. There are, like, a, pun a couple of really good ideas here. The demons wearing target uniforms. Right! Excellent. That's really that, good. Like, that's really good, because it is, it is... There is something really creepy about that. It's, you know, oh no, whatever horrible supernatural thing is going on has still not able to escape the horrors of, you know, the retail life. Yeah. Her being 20 in a situation where she should be like 16 or 17 and her parents treating her like she's 12 
Excellent. Was also, yeah, that was actually, that was really well handled. Like, that's really good. You know, I unfortunately, after getting through the book, I was like, did you do this because it's important for the current discourse that she not be a minor or anywhere close to it if she's going to express sexual feelings? She doesn't, I mean, there's a very little and she, Which like, she barely does. Actually, I mean, she has the same kind of sexual feelings that, like, um, the the heroine of the book eaters does. And actually, it's sort of the same, like, we're going to kiss you while we're running away from the final act thing that the book eaters ends on, almost to the to the letter, which is kind of funny. But, um, but yes, uh, there are some really good ideas in here. And then the more we explore the actual reasons be for this happening rather than leaving it sort of as this creepy thing, you know, the the worse they get. Like, the more demystified the demons get, the less scary they become. Um, right. And also... And by the time, honestly, by the time that she figures out that, one of, that they could be killed with fire, which is how she kills her ex-girlfriend's demon fairly early on, at that point the book just stops being scary. Yeah, no. It can be killed it's... with fire. Fire is actually really easy. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's remarkably, uh, it's remarkably sort of done by that point. Um, like this would actually work pretty well as like a creepy short story of you know, and then it can have the triumphant ending where the demon, where you know she kills the demon with fire, and goes off to find the girl or whatever. But yeah, and it's sort of it's this annoying thing where it's like every image in this book you could trace back to some horror movie or another, like the images of hell are from Hellraiser. Um, this is where the fact that I've seen like five horror movies in my life, if that yeah. is uh, the de the demons are from The Ring and all of the other like you know Ring knockoffs that there were. I thought The Ring was like a creepy girl who comes out of the television. Yeah, but she's, it's the same sort of stringy black hair, you know, always looking wet, you know, your fingers are too mm. long. Except that these are like older, except that these are older adults. Yes, exactly. Um, but th that's the sort of, that's the general kind of creepypasta monster that they're supposed to be. Actually, at the, when we first saw the, her demon, when she's like standing on the top of the, the of the cliff waiting to jump uh -huh. um, into the water, uh, I thought, oh, that's a former Camp Damascus member who killed her, who'd like drowned herself. Um, ah. Which would have kept the horror in a more, you know, at a more realistic level. And oh yeah, no, all the people, all your, all your failed con con uh, converts, you know, who commit suicide are instead, you know, roped to become supernatural demonic counselors. That would work great, actually. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. Um, but, but that, that would doesn't... involve having bad things happen to gay people, and that's not yeah. really allowed in this book. Or, you know, bad things are allowed to have happened, but, you know, they've completely processed it and worked through. Um, I also, another thing that I felt really unresolved, like, unhandled for me was she starts the book being, like, a genuine believer in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Oh yeah, she goes from zero to a hundred on eight. She goes from zero, like and, like, and like the thing is, there are people who grow up in evangelical contexts who are, who just like shrug it off and, you know, and it doesn't really stick. And, but those are generally people who were never really believers in the first place. Most of the time, the impression I get, you know, as somebody who has never been a Christian, is that leaving any kind of like fundamentalist cult religion, even if, you know, you have your crisis of faith, you go, I do not believe this. Um, and I, you know, and this means I cannot live in this society anymore. That there's some amount of questioning. It's not, oh, actually some Christians treated me badly. So I no longer believe in God. And this is completely uncomplicated and easy. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what, that's what Saul is for who on the road to Damascus has failed to change his name to Paul. Right. Um, <laughs> but Oh, is that a Christian reference? Is that a motherfucking Christianity reference? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I... You know, once upon a time, there was a man called Saul who persecuted Christians till he saw that the work was bearing fruit for the Christians. So the man changed his opinions in his Christian name to Paul. And, and, is, and Damascus is involved in this? Yeah, on the road to Damascus, that's where he, that's where Paul had his, Saul had his conversion, yeah. 
Right. So here's where like I've here's where I've spent a lot of time observing evangelicals from, you know, what I hoped was a safe distance and like summer camp and stuff. But I thought that was so obvious that I didn't need to say it. <laughs> one of us has had a Christian ish for a parent and one of us has not. That's true, I suppose. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I just is, one sort of absorbs these things over time or doesn't, as the case may be. Right. No, it's uh, well, that, honestly, this is part of the thing about growing up being a non-Christian in the South is that you like really don't absorb the You know, either you absorb it or you really don't, you know, that that does make sense. Yes. Um. So but anyway, yeah, no, that he's sort of there to demonstrate that um, that. He sort of ha has a more re realistic arc as a general matter. Um, right, because, like, he's still conflicted about it and, like, you know, is going to a different church and stuff. And whether or not that sticks or not, who knows. But, like, Saul, unfortunately, was a more fleshed out character than basically anyone else in this book. Yes, and his sort of, like, you know, being, like, really visibly counterculture is more in keeping with actual Jack Mormons that I've met. Again, not that these are... This is necessarily the Mormon Church, but you know. But no, I, no that's that's a good point. Um, the, uh, you know, I, honestly, it, Saul, I can see being a fairly convincing ex-Mormon who like joins a liberal Christian church. Yeah, um, he he the, really he's kind of the highlight of the book for me. Um, in like. Once we've once we've given up on this being an effective horror book, like right, like I, because you, you know the beginning for me is the real highlight. But yes, Saul Saul is the is the that is the highlight of the rest of the book, um, which is an, it's always it always does make me a little bit sad in a book that's supposed to be about queer women when like the best character is a man. But yeah, I mean this is sort of as the classic like the crush is you know the. The crush is the, uh, you know, is, I mean, she's the hot goth GF um, that you would want if you were on Tumblr. And also, like, she, you know, she loves and accepts your your stimming and your uh, autistic quirks because she's part of your found family, which the book says, you know, not the family that she was raised in, which the book says, and blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah. And it's just like, okay, clearly this per this character is just checked off a list, you know, but has no other traits. Um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which again, like the the whole thing where where you know Rose has these memories, uh, has has this doesn't you know she doesn't remember anything, but she has this sort of elaborate fantasy life about this girl who would be her best friend and do all of these things, and her brain like shies away from you know from it going anywhere sexual, um, but clearly she wants it to, and. She works, you know, she definitely works a lot better as a fantasy. Like, they're, they're, you would expect two extremely traumatized 20-year-olds who have both escaped their evangelical slash, their, their fundamentalist Christian cult um, of whatever stripe um, to, like, have some issue, you know, to not just immediately get along perfectly. No, well, once again, the book says... Oh, we, you know, they have a minor disagreement. And then the narrative voice says, it was good that they had a minor disagreement and were able to, you know, come to something about that. Because that's what good found family is like, not like the bad family that she came from. Um, so, you know, the book is aware of that. <laughs> it just doesn't, <laughs> you know, do it. <laughs> when you take two traumatized 20 year olds and it's their very first relationship, um, the idea that there's not a, that like, Ni that neither of them are ever going to break down sobbing or, you know, have somebody, one of them says something minor that turns into a whole thing because they didn't realize it was a trigger point. Just, it, it makes the relationship less, sa you know, the relationship seems less real. And thus, I it's hard for me to, A, have any investment in it, but B, to believe that it's going to last. Like, eventually yeah. all this suppressed trauma is going to come bubbling to the surface and they're going to have a horrible breakup and never speak again. Um... Because, you know, they they didn't deal with any of it. So let, let me let me use this as a, a jumping off point, if you'll indulge me, to talk about the prose a bit. Um, okay. And just the writing in general. Because, you know, we've taught, we've argued, well, argued, we've discussed at <laughs> recently whether, like, show not tell is good advice across the board. 
And as I think I've said in the jingle, um, you know, there's no hard and fast rules in writing. However, right. <laughs> um, there are, most of those rules are at least talking about something. Um, this is the bad kind of telling, not showing, because you are using the authorial voice to say a lot, a bunch of correct things, and then not only telling instead of showing, but telling and then not showing that happening at all. Mm -hmm. um, like you are, you are basically trying to gaslight us into thinking that that's the book that you're writing by telling us that these are the themes um, <laughs> without actually doing any of the writing of the book. Um, that's the kind of like telling, not showing that we want to avoid, I think, um, if one is, wants to write a good book. And there are a few other sins here, which is like, yes, I understand that, you know, um, first of all, don't say said is terrible advice. Um, and the reason that don't say said is terrible advice is this book, um, look at <laughs> the, it, it, when you're, when you're aware of it, it jumps out at you at every page. Try not to repeat words, good advice up to a point. But when you find yourself saying, trying to come up with different words for car, because you have to mention the car a whole lot. So you go, you know, sedan, vehicle, car, her vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. This is like what a this is like what a grammar book I read once, a style book I read once as a kid calls oblong yellow fruit syndrome. <laughs> yeah, or uh, what uh, aficionate uh, not as a fanfic would call the blue net syndrome. <laughs> right. Uh, and this is also like you know, er earlier on she like keeps going back and forth between referring to her parents as dad and mom and referring to them by her first names. And I'm like, is that a character bit? And it's like, no, actually, it's just so that we don't say dad and mom too many times. Um, it's the reason why, you know, one of the major reasons why, like, there's no such thing as, as good, hard and fast writing advice is because trying to follow a set of rules to, for good writing leads you to this. Um, <laughs> it leads you to, like, prose that is so, like, clunky that it is distracting. Um, and so that is why you should just write the way that you want to write. Fair. Well, what if the way you want to write is this? Well, then you're, I'm not going to be your ideal reader, but that's fine. And it's like <laughs> if you're writing, if you're writing porn, for example, or if you're writing a fanfic, um, or if you're writing a, a sort of a short story online for other people to read, fine, you know. But um, it over the course of an entire book, it becomes very difficult to uh, to handle. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh... Surely we can say that some things are bad Stylistically, if nothing else Like we can acknowledge my guitar playing is not particularly technically good That's fine And actually, yet another gripe I had about the plotting is that So she knows she's autistic, which yes. Well, first of all, the fact that she has basically unfettered access to the internet seems really weird for a teenager in a cult. Um, oh, no, her parents are too old to understand what phones are. And it's not like the, the the pastor and the priest are going to be extremely tuned into that and telling everybody who's don't a parent give your to their... Kids, right, like, don't give your right. kids smartphones. Um, the, the pastor and priest who, like, are these very, you know, modern, dressing, savvy, like, tech, you know, adjacent guys... They, they, they have sponsors from Silicon Valley and they're, they don't have like weird spyware and controlware for the kids' phones. That just seems highly suspect to me. Yes. Um, the, uh, but also, no, it's okay. So she's, you know, she knows she's autistic and either this should have been like a huge source of contention with her parents that, you know, she is self-diagnosed and they refuse to do anything or... Her parents, her mom should absolutely be an autism mom. <laughs> well, I mean, that would require her parents to be people. Yeah. I mean, her dad, her dad's personality is that he says, tells dad jokes and her mom dresses like Marge Simpson. I don't know if you caught that. I did not. Yeah. Green, green sheath dress and, and a string of pearls. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're just out of central casting. They're just there to be there. Um, which is a shame because her dad is actually the most effectively creepy character, more so than the counselor by a good margin, I think. Yeah, I actually, I thought 
that the therapist wasn't the therapist was a good um not necessarily creepy but again would have worked really well in a horror comedy movie the whole thing about like where you know why are you not displaying your medical um <laughs> cro- you know credentials on the wall oh well all of my christian credentials are so much more important right um but and I will say, here's another thing that the book does well, because, and I feel like this is probably, you know, drawn from experience, is that the particular combination of um, sort of othering praise and condescension that you give a gifted kid. Yeah. That is not made much of in the prose, but it's absolutely present in the way that everybody treats her. And thus, you know, feels like a real detail, you know. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good example of something that was shown and not told. Precisely. <laughs> um, well, oh, actually, though, um, speaking of, of, of writing, um, you will note that for an autistic person, she is extremely good at reading people's facial expressions and telling that there is like 90% of this emotion and 10% of that emotion in any given word or, you know, sort of micro expression that people are doing, because it's important again, for the author to tell us that that's what they're feeling in that moment. Right. Um, yeah. And she's never wrong. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that all autistic people are face blind, but it's, uh, she's really remarkably good at reading people. Right. And you know, the thing is that, um, you can, you can develop, you can be, get better at reading people if, you know, you've had a need, but there hasn't been any, you know, because her family has at least is seemingly been so loving up until now, except for when they packed her off to brainwash camp. Um, it's hard to see where she would have needed to develop that careful reading. Yeah. I got, I got that hypervigilance from being bullied for 10 years, you know, like, uh, I got it from my mother. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> you know. And even so, and even so, when you have that, the problem is it's still that it's, you know, you're not going to be able to say, oh, it's 10% this and 90% that. You tend to overread. Yeah, you tend to just become paranoid. Right. Um, as, as uh, not to say anything about my own uh, way of interacting <laughs> with people or anything. Um, but yeah, no. So l- let's talk about autism then. Uh, and All this right. is probably a good time to talk about Chuck Tingle. Mm-hmm. The author is dead, the author is dead, but in this case the author is also a work of fiction, so I feel that we can discuss him. So so here's so here's our our two extremely neurodivergent podcasters. Um. Hi. Um we I I am uh I am neurodivergent. I know a lot of neurodivergent people. Sorry, we just I just feel like, you know, in keeping with the Tumblr aesthetic of this book. Um, we should, you know, establish our hashtag own voices credentials right up front. I, uh, I, I'm not going to show you my card with two R's. I'm not going to tell you exactly what I'm sexually attracted to so that you know whether you want to follow me or not. <laughs> I am, however. I going mean, to say that I... didn't you accidentally <laughs> kind of let that slip from the last episode? No, that was ago? incidental. <laughs> That's not even the... Anyway. Um... <laughs> Sorry, you can cut that. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I, I'm perfectly happy to be bullied about that. But no, I... I no, I don't want to you know, increase your <laughs> hypervigilance. <laughs> I'm literate in all kinds of internet pornography. It comes with the territory. <laughs> but anyway sorry um, you can again okay. you i've been online since for since i was <laughs> since for at least the last 25 years yes I've been your online. parents did not control your internet access oh they um. did not <laughs> um, but anyway uh point being hi angel point being that um i know i know a bunch of like autistic creators right um and uh one of them you know when i was discussing this book with them said to me I think that Chuck Tingle is a person who, that whatever entity is behind Chuck Tingle is essentially um, faking it for attention. Um, that's like the that's the short version. But the the what they basically said was that you know the claim used to be that Chuck Tingle the person was the was a sort of nonverbal, um, extremely autistic person, and the person who was sort of mediating between him and the world was his son. Right. Um, and this narrative was uh 
was buried. quietly buried, including all the, the Reddit AMA where it first came out has been deleted, um, although screenshots still exist. And now, uh, even though the son is still mentioned on the website, Chuck Tingle is meant to be the author of this book. Um, and I personally, uh, and my, my friend's problem with him was basically the, the previous incarnation of Ch Chuck Tingle was an offensive stereotype that this yeah. person was putting on. Um, now I think that that's not necessarily the conclusion that I would come to. Right. That's not, that's not my conclusion. It's not my conclusion, but I, I don't think that it's unreasonable to, if you're an autistic person, to be offended by this sort of arc. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, to me, it also, it seems like a sort of a gradual, it can easily, just as easily be read as a sort of gradual sort of coming to terms and, you know, oh, I started this as a, as a, uh, as sort of a funny thing. Right. And now I, I want to I, pivot to something more serious. Oh, but see, now... my reading was that this is very much the, I started this as a funny thing and then, you know, and that was, and then realized that he actually was autistic um and right. and that and thus having you know learned more about himself has sort of quietly adjusted the authorial persona to be a more you know to be more in line with re you know and like you see that you know you, you see that a lot with that's also a very trans experience of oh here's my joke oh, yeah. character um or whatever like we we try out identities by often first as a joke it, it's an, it's sort of a, an accepted thing that half of the people who were on something awful making fun of like you know the the, the weirdos on the internet who didn't know how to mask um <laughs> half of them eventually come out as trans and you know sort of like man i wish i could have been like that the whole time you know yeah. um which yeah that's absolutely the case and i'm and i you know I personally would hope that one would be open about that as opposed to trying to hide the previous incarnation of it. But, you know, there's a lot of pressures involved. And there was also the fact that um, Chuck Tingle, the entity, was try was like used as a political pawn with, with the Sad Puppies thing in Worldcon. Right. Incidentally, putting Hugo nominee on the front of this book it takes the piss a bit, in my opinion. Yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, but... <laughs> no, that was great. But... Uh, you know, and it's like if you're put in that position, having thought that you're just sort of dabbling in this internet weirdness, but also incidentally making a lot of money from it, um, then it you might try to, you know, rebrand yourself in as in as sort of subtle and uh, and gentle a way as possible, so as to avoid exactly this kind of conversation happening. Well, actually, I assume it's more to uh, avoid waves of death threats and suicide baiting, but. Oh, and that. I mean, it's like, and that's another thing where it's like, it's really, it's, it's, it's hard to be on the internet um, as a, as anybody. It's hard to be on the internet. It's hard to be on the internet as a neurodivergent person or as a, as a marginal person. And particularly if you are trying to do, you know, if you're, if you're doing things that might be considered to be, you know, offensive or weird, um, you know, there can be consequences as we saw in the case of like helicopter story and all of that kind of thing. There, but you know, sort of, on another level, what we're seeing here is a person who was very good at creating a persona and marketing themselves, and is now trying to turn that into a career as a novelist. Um, and this book is not good. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and it's like I would, I don't, I don't like the idea of a per of a person just being like, okay, here's you know, red meat to, for my fan base and. But, you know, when I say I don't like this idea, it's not as if this doesn't happen all the time in, in like, every imaginable circle. I, I'm sure that you have had red meat thrown to you that you gobbled right up from oh, creators that you like. <laughs> I mean, we've all been teenagers. Uh, and 20-somethings, for that matter. Oh, yeah, sure. No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your your uh, your delicacy in not pointing out examples, which I'm sure are springing to your mind. But, um <laughs> Uh, well, you know, then I have to start thinking about my own. Uh, I, right. I've got, although honestly, you know, I've gotten fewer things pandered straight to me, but uh, it is very exciting when it happens. Um, mm -hmm. Really enjoying this whole Wizards versus Lesbian zeitgeist. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's... 
like that part I think is fine that you know that this is like red meat to a fan base like that's that's fine people this is there's definitely an audience for this and I think it is fine for that audience to enjoy this um I think that you know this could have been this could make a very good you know horror comedy movie with some tweaks sure. I think it would work really well as that um and you know and that would honestly help a lot because then having it not not being inside Rose's head would actually help a lot, I think. Um, since her lack of interiority is a real problem. I'm gonna be honest. It just annoys me that a person can market themselves in to a book deal. Which is very 90s of me. I think we need to reel in to get that money in mindset. And reintroduce the concept of selling out, which is still meaningful even for gay neurodivergent people. Possibly even more so for gay neurodivergent people. I think it's funny that, incidentally, that the whole, like, I'm going to write down things on an index card to make conversation about has come uh, so far from being a punchline about being on a bad date with a guy in the 90s uh, oh i thought that 80s. was a i thought that was a leverage reference because parker does that oh i'm sorry i've never seen leverage um speaking of you know cultural lacuna um speaking of you know things that sure do pander to uh, a fan base <laughs> myself included um, i've never met an autistic person who actually does that but you know i that's not to say that it doesn't happen in i mean life. i have I've written, I've like um, outlined and bullet pointed conversations that to have, and I have actually come, I actually have come up with a list. I haven't written it down on an index card. I have just assumed that I will remember it, and then having ADHD failed to do so. But I have like <laughs> drafted, you know, bullet points, uh, your talking points before. In like a business con uh, context or like a personal context. Both. All right. Well, like, there, I stand corrected. You know, uh, b before I first went to the synagogue. Um, <laughs> and that's, you know, that's really endearing. <laughs> yeah. No, because like, you know, you got you got to like practice conversation. You have to like run through a couple of possible ways a conversation go. For that matter, I actually, you know, would Leora and I had our big talk about feel about emotions before she came to visit. I did draft out in my head a decision tree of all the different ways the conversation could go. And then when she was too nervous to actually launch it, I offered to run down the decision tree and did so. Um, so you two are adorable, as I think I've so like probably said you before. know I actually found that to be perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> there, well, there you go. Thank you for thank you for that bit. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll call that another uh, another area where where this person gets it. So yeah, no the the besides the like the weird the weirdly being able to read people's minds to their faces, uh, the, the actual characterization of the autistic main character, not bad. Right down to the off-putting vanity over being a curious person, which is the currently acceptable way of saying that you're smart. Certainly the fact that, like, I did think the fact that she, there were times when she knew that saying the thing was going to make everything more difficult and yet she just had to say it. I thought that was very good. Yeah, who among us has not been in that? Before? Right, exactly. Um, to this day, it still happens to me on a regular basis. It's just so satisfying to say the thing. I know. You know, yeah. No, it would have been better if we were not inside her head, particularly because she's just the sort of, she functions as the author's dropping, you know, thoughts and themes into the book funnel a lot of the time. And, like, there was one part where she's like, you know, you know, later in the book where she's like such and such is a thing with queer people and i'm like queer people right have you ever said queer people in your life right exactly <laughs> you know? yeah that that was that one stood out to me too yeah it's if like if that young woman has ever heard the word queer it has been used as a slur precisely um um well i don't know maybe she's been very active on the internet but um but then... she's been very on the internet she would have realized that she was gay yes uh, so so here's here so i i want to i want to say one final thing um uh -huh. 
if you are going to take mushrooms for the first time, and the book, in much the same way that it doesn't specify what religion this is supposed to be, it doesn't specify what drugs they are that she is taking here. But um, if you're, it's not ayahuasca that you're getting in a small town in Montana. That's that's just like psilocybin tea that she that she gets. Uh huh. And um, a, that's not how that works, <laughs> in any sense. B, do not. You know, the whole thing that she says to, her, for, to the other people, it's like, don't talk to me. Don't, you know, don't interact with me at all. Don't do that. Ah. If you decide to take mushrooms, you want the good music on. You want people being nice and friendly and able to talk to you and, like, reify your sense of reality. Telling people to ignore you is possibly the worst thing that you can do. <laughs> okay. Um, Noted. So this is a public service announcement. Uh, the A, you can't use... This is not how psilocybin therapy works. It is a real thing, but that's not how you do it. Yes. Um, also, please, please <laughs> do not do drug assisted therapy just like for the heck of it with your former camp counselor who's just as traumatized as you are. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, 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 not good. I mean, it, particularly when you're if you're like trying to recover old traumas, that's the, really the thing about when you're on mushrooms. That's like the, the thing that you don't want to think about. I I was, that did occur to me. <laughs> But, you know, I'm I'm not the recreational drug user of this podcast. Um, yeah, I, 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 I will use my my status as that to be like just like every single thing about that. And from the process of what it feels like to the to how it's done in, in the circumstances, just like no wrong, bad, don't. Um, well, you know, they, they can't they can't they couldn't use hypnosis because that gets into recovered memories. Yeah, and satanic panic, and uh, so forth and so on. The satanic panic was not just all lies. There were, in fact, cults who molested children. And some of those teens who drew pentagrams on their lockers went off to kill their friends. But it was a vanishingly small minority And if you give the people in charge an inch They will take a mile And that's how we ended up with webcams in all the school bathrooms If that reference isn't accurate now it will be in five years. Um, I will say, by the way, um, if you want, if you like the idea of this book, and this is you, the audience, um, although I hope that I can get you to read it eventually once it's finished, um, as we've discussed, but uh, read Crow Killers because this is pretty much the same idea. Um, I will totally give it a read once it is finished, and if there's like a downloadable version. Oh, there absolutely is. Um, Great. Once it is finished, then. And uh, but yeah, no Crow Crow Killers is about a small town with a with a sort of you know religious cult running it who are you know tapping into um, like otherworldly forces and using children. Uh, to access those forces uh, um, but it is as different from this book as <laughs> night is from day um, and it's a very different kind of gay uh, and you and you may enjoy it more or less but um, if you like this concept and you want a very very different way of handling it try crow killers or but I'm a cheerleader if you want a different different that's way. a very very different way of handling right. it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's a satanic cult in in, in no no but there's a conversion camp uh that is true like, that is true. I, you know i it, it is unfortunate that the uh you know extremely campy romance about going to conversion camp actually in some ways does a better job of making the scariness of conversion camp obvious you know among other yeah. things the threat of homelessness is real and scary I mean, yeah, if that's if I mean, if I we want to go full circle all the way back to sort of where we started this episode, like the major letdown here is that just you don't need to add this kind of like, you know, horror movie glop on top of it to make something terrifying out of this. As a matter of fact, like, I feel like it's almost this almost makes it less scary to me. <laughs> right. No, like I, I converge honestly, de like demonic hell fly larva being implanted in you is in some ways, you know, it. at least in this book, it seems to have far less lasting emotional trauma um, than, like, actual Exodus or whatever the 
ex-gay camps are called. My teenage cousin was raised strict Catholic. He got really into heavy metal. He was excited to show me all the different genres he was into there. The death and the doom and the satanic rituals. But when I played him Daniel Johnson, he found it just a little bit too scary in his old town. And I think there's something to be said about masking real terror with cartoon horror, real fears with cartoonish exaggerations. But then again, I've never been a horror movie person. But you would need to, like, really, you would need characters with emotional lives that are complicated enough to exhibit, like, trauma symptoms in order to do that. So, you know, it's what you're capable of, I guess. Um, so uh, is there anything else that we should talk about before we, uh, before we get out to this? No, I, or, or I, before we move on? I, I feel like we've, uh, we've just about wrapped this up. And, uh, well, in that case, I handily enough, next week we're going to be talking about another uh, small town that is run by a sort of crypto-satanic cult. Oh, are we doing Night in the Woods next week? We're doing Night in the Woods next, yeah. Oh, that's right, because I'm going to be in, uh, with... Yeah, uh, live with, in with Portland. Live in Portland with special guest Kiana. Indeed, I'm really looking forward to that one, because we're also going to be discussing what a furry is, and... While I may not be able to tell you what an autistic person is, boy, howdy, I can do, I can give a, <laughs> tell you what a furry is a shot. Are they the same thing? Tune in next time. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, that That's as good a line to end it on as any, I think. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>